Hello, this is Don Victor, author of Drawn to Win, host of the podcast Drawn to Win, the director of the Academy of Composition, and the creator of the Core 80 Experience, also known as the C and Grow Rich in Art video course, which you can find out more information at core80.com. This is the Drawn to Win podcast, where I have the incredible privilege to draw artists from around the world into fun and meaningful conversations around art and life, and yes, maybe even a little food. You can hear us each week on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. So make sure you subscribe so you always have a seat among friends. Let's get into the show. Holy Spirit, well, we just want to welcome you into this conversation. We're going to talk about creativity and the voice. And uh, who better to have that conversation with than in your presence? So, Lynn, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. So, you are, where are you located? In Erie, Pennsylvania. Well, look at that. Isn't that strange? <laughs> so am I. That's right. And for Erie, being known as the blizzard capital of the world, in my mind, I don't know if it's true or not. <laughs> it is. Oh, it is? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> well, how much snow was it? Was it last year or two years ago on Christmas Eve? Yes. They, they did misreport it as like um, 63 inches. Um, evidently, they measured it incorrectly, but in actuality, it was like 55 or something. So, wow. yes, it was. And I was out driving in it, so I'm attesting to the fact that, yes, indeed, there was that much snow falling. Uh, yeah, we That's average almost six years, feet in yes. one night. <laughs> yes. We average 111 inches of snow per year. Wow, really? Yes, That's really. <laughs> the night that um, all that snow fell... Six mm -hmm. feet of snow. That must have solidified in some, probably most children's lives, that Santa Claus is real. Because how exactly. in the world? <laughs> exactly. Can he make it without a sleigh? Because <laughs> the rest of us weren't going anywhere, that's for sure. <laughs> now, for the families that were doing their Christmas shopping the on Christmas Eve, Mm -hmm. They woke up on Christmas Day and said, Santa Claus is not real. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was an experience. It really, really was. It was, but in its own way, I mean, people are still talking about it. Um, yeah, right. It's kind of, you know, there's, it's kind of a bad badge of courage, I guess, <clears throat> to look at it that way. Um, we made national news. People talked about us for a long time. So wow. it's all good. It's all good. And yet this is my first winter here. Mm -hmm. And it is miraculously beautiful. How many years have you been in Erie? I've been a little over 30 years. 30 years. And how would you describe this this winter versus th over 30 years of winter? I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word winter because it really hasn't been bad at all. My daughter and her <laughs> partner came and visited on Christmas, and it was like in the uh, high 50s. And we did hikes and walks and went to the beach and took a walk, and you just don't do that in Erie in, in December. So I wouldn't really even call it a winter, actually. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been beautiful. I was terrified to come here because of it. Oh, really? I am not uh, a, a winter person. I got Caribbean mm -hmm. blood okay. flowing through me. So uh, even though I got some blood from that uh, Iberian Peninsula, Portugal, Spain area, um, that Caribbean that Angolan blood, that African mm -hmm. blood, that Canary Island blood. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's not eerie blood. <laughs> it's not eerie yet. But I'm so. from Wisconsin, and it's a lot colder there, and mm. we do get our share of snow. So actually coming here, the winters, to me, there was more snow because of the lake, but it was uh, much, much milder than nice. where I came. So I'm coming from the opposite, where, yeah. you know, like it was below zero for the whole month of January. And <laughs> That's cold. I don't know that I could go back to it because I'm used to the warmer winters. So you do get used to it, though, but we have to want to get used to it, I guess. I'm assuming the people who went and settled those places came with uh, adult beverages from their mother country. Mm -hmm. because you have to be drunk and crazy to, <laughs> to be like, yeah, this is where I want to go. <clears throat> I don't <Wow>. know. <laughs> 
it's its own aesthetic, but it's actually very, very pretty. It's very pretty. And in some ways, you know, my, my, uh, my aesthetic, when I think about it, is neutrals and it's blacks mm -hmm. and browns and grays and whites. And I never really thought about it actually to this very second as I'm looking out the window here. In some ways, maybe my environment has influenced that. I mean, I'm thinking I would like it anyway, mm -hmm. but the, the, uh, the palette here, if you're not used to it, I guess can look drab. Uh, uninteresting but if you're from here I mean I don't I see a lot of different what I would call colors and or neutrals that maybe other people wouldn't see so I, I kind of wondered some ways if living here for 30 years has influenced you know the choices that I make as far as color or lack thereof in my art and I never really thought about that before I can totally see that I can totally mm -hmm. see that um there is something beautiful about it that was actually my prayer when I came here rather mm -hmm. than focusing on the the hatred that I have with snow and mm -hmm. not snow, but cold. Mm -hmm. um, the, I did set in my mind that I wanted to find a spirit in the, in the, in, in the snow, in the cold mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that I would fall in love with. Right. So, well, we haven't had enough snow for you to do that. I don't think. Well, there were moments of it. <laughs> and maybe maybe that's just life's wonderful wisdom to kind of you know gradually you know kill the frog in me you know boil mm -hmm. the frog. Well, I think that when you are used to the four seasons, as I am, there's value in each one of them, and without one of them, the rest of them don't sing. I mean. Spring is the most beautiful time of the year because by the end of March, as nice as winter can be, you're tired of the jackets and the coats and the mm -hmm. you know shoveling the snow, and then all of a sudden, the, you know, flowers and grass and things you haven't seen for a while come into bloom, and the smell of spring is like no other. It's just it's like a rebirth. And as a person, at least for me, I kind of feel that it's a new time, it's a new year. It's a, I become invigorated, you know. And then during the summer, it's fun and it's sunny and it's warm. But even by the the end of the summer it's like well okay now I've had enough sun and then the leaves change and if you haven't seen a, a fall I mean it's like no other it's just beyond gorgeous and then of course we sort of segue back into winter and each one of those seasons I think feed off each other and as a as emotionally as a person you go through like a resting time and you go through an active time and you go through a rebirth time and I, I mean I may be getting dramatic here but I don't think so I think that I've always been keenly aware of how the seasons influence us as individuals. Mm -hmm. And I strongly believe in that. And I think that for me, as much as I would like more sun, I will be very honest after being here 30 years, I really don't know that I could go without the four seasons. I think they provide uh, uh, just a richness in my life. And I think I would miss if it was sunny all the time and warm. You know, my, my, my dad says that kind of stuff. And I look mm -hmm. at him like, what are you talking about? Um, <laughs> it's crazy, right? And when I lived in the islands uh, and when I lived in the south, uh, mm -hmm. down in Georgia, it, in the Georgia, it did get cold during the uh, winter. But mm -hmm. I don't think it ever snowed. Eight years there, I'm not sure it ever snowed unless you were right. in Atlanta. But, um, <clears throat> but for me, I, I personally like the consistency there's something okay. about getting up every day knowing it's basically the same. And, Interesting. Uh, See, I would find that unnerving. Oh, and I think absolutely. that's just <laughs> probably just where you come from and what you know what you're used to. Yeah. What 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 uh what what sign are you in? What what? What sign are you? Oh, Taurus. Oh, really? That's interesting. Oh, yeah. Okay. Are you a cusp? <laughs> are you on a cusp, or are you like a solid Taurus? I'm trying, when does it cut? I think I'm on, I'm April 25th. So I think oh, I'm yeah, towards. Oh yeah, you're right there on the. Uh, right there. You're yeah. at cusp. So you're right. April 25th. What comes after that? A Aries, right? Aries, right. Yeah. Wow, you're interesting. <laughs> I know a very few Taurus Aries people. Oh, really? And they tend to be very, very profound people that I've met in my life. Hmm. Um, very individual. Yes, I would say that's true. Very, it's like. <laughs> it's like they're stubborn like i won't call it stubborn because that's actually not the right word it's more of a strength like i am who i am right mm -hmm. it's very aries but you have this this almost i want I, well i'll use the word stubborn nature of the um of the, the Taurus. Taurus that and that's, that. yes yes and i find that remarkable interestingly enough 
the three people I'm thinking about, all women as well. And they're all in the arts. Hmm. And they're That's all like good like at hmm. what they do, which is interesting. Huh. Hmm. <laughs> Lots of respect for that for that cousin. <laughs> Well, there I am. <laughs> <laughs> also, they have a very beautiful sense of an old spirit, an old soul to them. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to get a, a sense of that from you as well as we have a, this conversation. Okay. So real quick, back to the snow. Mm -hmm. um, what, what is it about the snow itself visually, this visual experience that you have, mm -hmm. um, or maybe winter, what do you find beautiful in it? And by beautiful, I'll paint this picture. You're standing outside and the sun warms your face. That experience, what, what in the winter gives you that experience? I, I, um, well, that's a very good question. I think it's the sheer beauty of it. It's when you take a landscape or wherever you are and you, it's covered in snow, it's I don't want to use the word fairyland because that sounds kind of, you know, I don't know, ridiculous. But there is this sense of a, of, of a new a newness, a new way of looking at the same thing that you see every day when you look out your window. The first snowfall is beyond gorgeous. Mm -hmm. You've had fall and all the leaves are off and you have trees that are just kind of standing there doing not, I mean, they're beautiful, but not striking in any way. And after the first snowfall, there's this sense of just peace, quiet beauty it's not ostentatious like fall is just like you know it's riotous in the fall i mean the, the colors are just beyond but in this in the winter there's this quietness about it i think that's part of it and there's it's it i think it lends itself to reflection hmm. uh, you know what i'm saying i mean hmm. that's it's it's not so much a physical reaction of the sun on your face as a as a kind of a almost a spiritual feeling of peace and calm and, and the ability to reflect. And then if you do get some sun with the snow, there is nothing like it. I mean, the reflection of the sun on the snow is, is just, it's really gorgeous. And then I know you're not a real fan of winter, but the winters here in Erie are pretty slushy because they're, they don't get, it doesn't get real cold here and we have the lake. Where I'm from in Wisconsin, we have a lot of snow. Um, it's very cold, but it's also very sunny. And if you go out on a sunny day in the snow, it crunches when you walk, which to me mm. is what a real winter is. There's nothing like it. I mean, you know, it's kind of like walking through leaves, you get that crunch. But if you're on cold, crunchy snow, and it's a pristine snow, and it's new, and the sun is out, it's just, it's a, it's kind of a playful feeling, but it's also very, um, it's very calming. And um, I just really like it. I don't know. That's cool. That's cool. That's beautiful. Okay. I like the little crunching sound. I know what you're oh, talking about, too. Yes. And yeah. it doesn't happen here very often. And when it happens, people here are not happy. And I'm ecstatic. I'm like, this is winter. <laughs> you're like a child. Yes. Remembering the olden days. Yep. Uh, uh, yeah. It, there is something about, you know, people say the stillness that happens when snow falls. Mm -hmm. um, I think mm -hmm. visually what happens is it's a, it's a great equalizer, right? It, it yes. removes texture, it removes depth from things, and it's almost in a weird way allows us to, to live in a three-dimensional space with mm -hmm. a two-dimensional reality. Because you mm -hmm. have the darkness of the trees, but everything else is light, and it's, it's, it's very, it changes the dimension that we live in. Right. But I would disagree in one respect. I think it's very textural. I just think it's yeah. different than what, we're, oh, yes. I, I mean, cotton is very textural, the cotton buds, you know, but you would think, well, there's not much to them, but there really is. There is dimension, is and there is depth and shadows, and I think that snow gives its own form of texture. So well, I think that, you know what I'm it's, saying? It's actually very interesting you bring that up because um, part of your work, you work with fabric, mm -hmm. and, and explain to the, explain to the, to the people who are listening to you. <laughs> you work with sheets of white fabric, obviously grays and blacks, but let's just talk about mm -hmm. the white. Okay. But you do something to the fabric that from a distance, it just looks like a white fabric, but as you get closer, what is it that you do? Well, I do a lot of things. First of all, the fabric that I use has some um, texture in it to begin with. I very seldom work with just plain fabric like goes against my religion or something. I love texture and I'm a very kinesthetic person and that's all like 
That's mm. how I can explain it is I just, I love texture. It's, it's my very favorite thing. And um, so the white quote unquote fabric that I use has texture and it has some lines and some like scrapings and small scribbles and like a white or an off white, a little bit of gray. So I start with that. And then I oftentimes stamp certain oh, circles or, or lines or whatever on top of that. And then I will layer it with fabric and then I quilt over that. And I use different stitches and different threads. And I always use like a variegated thread most of the time. Um, so it, I'm just adding a lot of different texture and what I call color, you know, to the background and also to the, the uh, foreground of the piece. And it's very subtle, but that's what I kind of like about it. You know, it, it's when you, when you do fabric, you stand back and you can take a fabric that has a bit of pattern to it. But when you stand back, if it looks solid that they say it reads as a solid and that's in a lot of ways what my work does it reads like the background in particular that you're referring to would read as a solid but it really isn't and the closer you get to it the more you see and I really like that about about what I do is is taking that simple palette and creating some depth and some texture that's beautiful I, I think um it, it just adds this beautiful level of sophistication, right? I think it's, mm -hmm. it's not loud, but it just has this this slight hum to it. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. It's mm -hmm. not like it's not like putting on a TV and having like that static sound, you know? Right. Right. It's just this beautiful little hum to to these shapes, and um, and obviously not audibly. Um, <clears throat> It could be, but I think it would require LSD or something. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, visually, as the eye picks up just these slight hints of shadow and highlight, shadow and highlight, which is what texture is, mm -hmm. but it's such a subtle shadow. Mm -hmm. And the highlights are kind of almost um, uh, hidden inside the whiteness of the fabric. But Correct, it's just yeah. enough that it just, it's just beautiful. It really is. Oh, thank beautiful. you. <laughs> it really is. Um, so what are you working on currently? Well, currently I am, a lot of my work, I think, in the past has been concept driven. And I still, I, I have, I put meaning into my work. It means something to me or it's a message maybe I'm trying to send. But with this, uh, lately what I've been doing is starting simply with shapes mm. and line and texture and working with that and keeping it more simple and just playing with the different shapes and that. And I will then take like a picture of, I have like a, um, um, what do I want to say? It's like a flannel board where I'll put up some shapes and things and then I'll take a picture of it and then I will draw on that picture of like how I might add some lines or that. And so I've just been playing with it and prior to this podcast which has really kind of helped me focus a bit I thought to myself well, what am I you know, you know what am I really really doing here and what am I trying to achieve with um, the shapes and the lines and the texture other than something that's interesting and pleasing and I think that um, in reflection I'm dealing with what I call disequilibrium and the joy of that um, I use oblique lines. I'm starting to use much more like scribbly, scrawly lines. Uh, in back, having a piece maybe more weighted, uh, conflicting directions within the piece. And I think that for me, we're in a time where um, the status quo and the equilibrium is what, you know, people don't want to go off that path. Um, they find it frightening or they find the unknown frightening, as we all do. Um, but I think that it's in disequilibrium that we find out who we are and, and what life is about. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at now in my work is kind of the joy of disequilibrium. You know, um, I'm not in a sense following all the rules when I put my piece together. Um, and I'm trying to, again, it's my voice. It's something that comes from me. I don't even understand all of it. Um, but I'm using, I'm trying to keep it simple in the sense of lines and shapes and then embellishing it with texture with the idea of someone looking at the piece and going, oh, well, what is that? And why was that done? And get people a little bit off point to think a little bit outside the box and maybe think about things a little bit differently. So that's kind of where I'm at. I'm always making meaning out of what I do. So this podcast gave me a good opportunity to take a look at what I'm doing, saying, okay, what is it that I'm doing? And mm -hmm. 
I've heard other artists say that, you know, they don't always know why they do what they do, but when you allow yourself to do it, you know, sometimes you, you know, you find out. I talked to this one woman, she was a quilt instructor and her husband had passed away. And Mm -hmm. so to deal with that, and she's an artist, she, she was working on this piece and working on this piece and working on this piece. And when she got done, she realized it was like all in greens. And she said it was her way of healing. Mm. And she, her thing is, she says, you will um, work in the colors and in the style that you need to work in. And she wasn't even aware that she was doing this. And she's done this for a long time. And I really took that to heart, you know, because I think sometimes, well, partly because I'm self-taught, I don't always know what I'm doing. But I also don't sometimes know what I'm doing because I'm unaware of what it is I'm expressing. And so Mm. I have a tendency sometimes to just do it and kind of look at it after or as I'm doing it and try at that point to say, well, what is it that I'm trying to do here? And, um, but I really like the idea in art that it gives rise to, it gives someone and anyone the opportunity to have a voice and to, to put out there what it is that they're mulling over or thinking about or is of importance to them. And I, I'm beginning to believe that you don't need to understand all of that before you make the piece of art, that it evolves and, it, it, and it's like the piece teaches you about you. Does that make any sense? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So that's kind of where I'm at with, with what I'm doing. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting process. Um, mm-hmm. Sometimes, I think it was, uh, uh, oh, darn it, I can't think of his name right now. The guy who wrote the books on um, Game of Thrones. Oh, and, yeah. And he was saying how, there are two kind of authors. There's the architect author, and then there's the gardener author. Mm-hmm. So the architect, he has everything planned out before he starts writing. Mm-hmm. The gardener, he's just cultivating this thing, and it's kind of like a wild garden. And you know, <laughs> that'd be me. This, the, yeah, <clears throat> that would so, be. <laughs> you know, and, and there's that deep, uh, uh, you know, that that um, two sidedness and everything. You know, so in, we call it the romantic, the romantics versus the classics. Mm-hmm. Uh, classical artists and um and it's funny as you study history art history you know this this debate it it's always there you know mm-hmm. um i think in the end you just have to own who you are right you know i i, I would agree with that it, when i did when i first started this of course i my my default is when i don't know something i try and research it out or try and figure it out so I started with the wrong questions like okay what is art that's what I'm doing let's try and figure out what this is oh my lord in heaven there's like everything I read I mean it it all kind of said the same thing but not I mean there's just it's such a loaded question in a way I don't know if we know what art is or if there's any consensus on what it is Uh, I was just kind of blown away by I remember this one article they had like 30 artists and they all had a quote and everyone was valid and legit and yet some of them were seemingly at odds with each other. So mm. I kind of learned to really, I don't know if there's an answer to that question. I, I, I really, I don't know. It's kind of an overwhelming proposition to try and figure it out, I think. Yeah, I think nowadays it's far more thought of, art is thought of as more of an expression of something. Mm-hmm. But in the classic sense, an art, isn't an expression it just means a body of knowledge right so a doctor has okay, an art right. he has mm-hmm. true a, spe- mm-hmm. a specific knowledge about something he understands the terrain in which it's in the dangers that are associated with it with inside that he could lead other people you know help guide them mm-hmm. things like that so art just means this this base of knowledge and, okay you know, and so <clears throat> now we think of it more as an expression and there mm-hmm. is there is that aspect because in the the classic sense you want to be connected to the muse even if you're a doctor or you're doing math if you're an accountant right mm-hmm. let's say you're an accountant that sounds like a boring job for most of us <laughs> dealing with numbers but there's a beauty in it you can actually because you have this knowledge base right mm-hmm. and depending on how you see yourself who you are if you take the responsibility on to guide and lead and protect other people let's say this person comes to you with their money issues Mm -hmm. you're the accountant and you take this kingly role on right to guide them 
And then you have this knowledge and you're able to connect to the muse, connect to your God source, your, your, this divine nature, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Then this becomes the language numbers that you get Correct. to yeah. basically minister to another human being, you know, mm -hmm. so that they can have peace of mind, peace of heart, peace of life um, when it comes to something very important like their finances. Right. It's the same thing for us. You know, it's, we, we get to minister, if you will, to people visually, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's, uh, it's, we're lucky that we get to do it that way. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, so how, how did you get started in this? Um, well, I don't know if there's, but was a clear path. I think when I was young, I, I always wanted to do art and various things in my life prevented me from doing that. So um, when I became older, I uh, uh, like 20 years ago or so now, I had a friend and she quilted. Mm. And of course, it, well, I think it was the texture that, that drew me in. Mm. But when I first started, um, it was a Friday night and we went out for a couple of margaritas and that having a good time. And she says, well, can we stop at a Joanne fabric on the way home? And I'm thinking, okay, this is Friday night. I don't know that I really want to be walking around in a Joanne fabric, but okay. Thank God I had two margaritas in me because I was like bored stiff. I'm like, why are we here? <laughs> and so she taught me how to quilt, bought me a pair of scissors. And I fell in love with just, I'm a kinesthetic again, so it's, I, I'm manipulating this fabric. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, I'm seeing all this really neat, the neat patterns and the colors and, and all that. And I, so I started making traditional quilts. I hand quilted. Um, and then I found myself, whenever I go somewhere, the first thing I do, I'd look up a fabric store and have to get to that fabric store. And I thought, mm. I've come a, a long way since that Friday night when I was in Joanne. And I just love fabric. I mean, I could just spend hours looking at fabric. And um, so I started making traditional quilts and following patterns and all that. And that didn't last too long. I started kind of just making things on my own and making things up. And um, my, my first, I guess, art quilt piece, what I love, the Digliani, and um, mm -hmm. I love his faces. And I just thought, well, I don't know what I'm doing, but maybe I could make a face. And I, so I kind of made a face, um, very stylized, but I made a face and then I quilted it, and I just really liked it. And then from there, I just started experimenting. And it started mainly with um, gift giving. My daughter's a meteorologist, so for her college quilt, I made her one that looked like a tornado, and I made up the pattern. <laughs> and, you know, my other daughter likes, uh, he's like martinis, so I made her a martini quilt. And so I started making things up, making my own patterns and um, making faces. I do have some quilts of faces. And I just kind of went from there. And um, so it's really interesting for me because I was in this netherland where I had a lot of quilting skills, but no, by no means all that I should have had because I kind of bopped around and didn't follow a path. And then I'm a self-taught taught artist, so I would, you know, take, you know, read about color or maybe take a quilting class on design here and there, so very sporadic. And then I really wasn't considered an artist because fiber artists aren't real artists. And then I wasn't a quilter either because I didn't do anything the way you were supposed to do it as a quilter. So I was just kind of in this no man's land, which as it turned out was wonderful because there weren't, I mean, there weren't any rules to break. I could kind of do whatever I wanted. So I just kept making pieces that, you know, sometimes they're very concept driven. Sometimes they were gifts. Sometimes they were just experimentation and, and things grew. And um, my daughter said to me, you know, you really like what you do. You need a website. And so she made an initial website for me that showcased a lot of the gifts that I had made. And I was in um, a local uh, shop here and they were looking for an artist for gallery night. And um, I, my daughter kept saying, you got to do this. So I just kind of and I'm not a real positive person, a real confident person doing this. I said, well, I have a website. They looked at it right then and there and signed me on for the show. And since then, I've been trying to actually pursue art as a, as a profession. Wow. That's a cool story. <laughs> That's very, very cool. That's very cool. It is interesting uh, that you would say you're not an artist or at one time or people didn't consider you an artist because you do mm -hmm. the fabric, right? Mm -hmm. Correct. Um, it's still the case, actually. It's, it's an uphill struggle. 
it really yeah, is. I think in a strange way that that that, that can be, mm -hmm. depending on how you market your story, right? Mm -hmm. And so there needs to be just a slight little education in that, but um, not on your part, but the, the people who are looking at mm -hmm. your work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I'm not sure it's actually that big of a struggle. I have found it. I, I have found, what I have found is more than marketing the piece, it's the way it's displayed. And what mm -hmm. I started just watching what people were doing um, when you hang, and even my daughter even says, mom, I don't want a quilt hanging on the wall. She says, no, nobody no. in my generation wants that. So with my pieces, I, I quilt them differently than the traditional quilter and use different um, materials. But then I stretch my own canvas and I incorporate some fabric paint and that people will give that a second look and see that as art. If I took that, I guarantee you, if I took that same piece, the exact same piece, and the only difference is I didn't put it and stretch it on canvas, people would walk by it and not consider it art. Well, exactly. I mean, it's kind of like having a bear in your house. Ah! Yeah. <laughs> well, it's dead and skinned and laying on the floor. It's like, oh, that's cool, right? Well, right. maybe not for everybody, but... Um. Right. No, I but, but I hear what you're saying, but it's know, very critical for fiber. Absolutely. If you talk to fiber artists, that's been the story for, and I've talked to, you know, some of them, some of the teachers I've had, and they say the way you present your work is everything. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that because when when I saw it, if you can ever see Lynn's work in person when she stretches it on a canvas from a distance, and by distance I mean you know 20 feet, you think you're looking at a painting. And then you're like, what? It like blows your mind when you realize it's fabric. And then all of the texture in there that you hand stitch in there, that mm -hmm. brings it even to another level of insanity in a way. Right? You're just like, and it's just, so it, on the surface, it gives you that fine art feel. Mm -hmm. But then as you get deeper into it, you, you become, you're not an artist, you're an artisan, right? You're, you're, there's, a whole level of craft that goes into it. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of practice, a lot of hours. Y yeah, yeah. And and so you're making artifacts, not just uh, things to decorate people's houses. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, it's, it's, and you have a style. Um, your work is, it's very impressive. Thank you. Very impressive. Thank you. Well, it was a journey. It was a journey in uh, this one uh, group of things that I had done, and this was with color, which I don't use a lot of use a lot mm -hmm. of color. And I made like fourteen pieces and everything. And they were I was downstairs, and they were all in the basement, and I'm you know framing them and that. And as I stood there, I turned and looked around, and I said, "You know, the same person made all these," which yes. I guess is very. I mean, again, I'm self taught, <clears> so I don't totally understand some of the concepts and some some of the um, goals that people have. But my understanding is that you have a signature and that your signature needs to be seen in your pieces. And that's what finally happened, I think, as I turned around and I said, well, the same person made these. And so I knew I had accomplished something, that I yeah. was on my way to – and even my friend one time, I just had a piece somewhere, and she walked in and she knew immediately it was mine. And mm -hmm. I said, well, how the heck did you know it was mine? Well, it's yours. We know it's yours. And I don't always see that, but I guess I'm getting closer to having my work be recognizable. So I must be repeating some something or yeah, a certain there's, there's styles a, emerging a, or something. I'm not sure. There's a formula behind it all. It's weird. Like if I do graphic design mm -hmm. or I do a painting or I do a drawing, there's something about it that you can tell it all came from me and Neat. and even though they're totally different mediums and tools and everything else um <clears throat> there's a certain way that i order things uh, hmm. okay a little bit of a tightness to it um but uh, there's an intelligence to it as well and um and and and, and, and i like clean things like i like my mm -hmm. work to feel clean Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just the opposite. Mine's very messy. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's really weird. I it, it, see. I would never look at your work as messy, right? It's you have this very strange thing where you're 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 jumping into it in that spirit of making it messy, but the choices you make ultimately have this really clean order to them. Interesting. No, see, that's very interesting. Yeah, I would wow. never call yourself what you're doing messy. 
Interesting. It's a, it's, it's a, if it is, it's a highly intelligent mess. And, and <laughs> that's cute. <laughs> I like that. The highly intelligent our... mess. I might have to write that one down. That's pretty Go good. Ahead. <laughs> that one comes from the great Myron Barnstone. He, uh, my drawing master, when he would always say to us, all I require from you is an intelligent mess. I like that. I like that a lot. All right, cool, cool. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you do have this beautiful style, and I and it's funny because I'm probably going to say his name wrong, but I'm going to say it the way I say it. Mogi okay. Gianni. Yes. Um, Mogi. Uh, strangely, you can see that influence in your work. Really? Oh, oh that's yeah. interesting. Oh, and wow. it comes down to the way that you space things, um, and maybe even like the 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 in a weird way i want to say some of the lankiness of your shapes um, that's interesting that's really interesting it would be fascinating for us to sit down and look at a few uh mogi works mm -hmm. and put a piece of tracing paper over it grab a black marker and start breaking it down into simple shapes and okay. um and and uh and just seeing what the patterns are once you remove the representation, correct. Okay. Seeing what the patterns, the geometry that's actually underlining it all. But seeing why? Why did I? You know, I mean, I was instantly drawn to his work. I have no idea why. You know what I'm saying? It's not like I knew. It's like I didn't even know anything. I didn't know who he was. Do you know what I'm saying? But instantly, I just there's just certain things that I'm just in just in life. I guess that I'm instantly drawn to, and I've always wondered. What is that? You know, um, where does that come from? Well, the answer is very simple. You're, you're okay. talking to yourself. So everyone you meet, you meet yourself. I know it sounds very esoteric, but when you sit down and realize, do you? But how did yourself, yourself do you, come? Uh, but how did yourself come to be? I mean, I remember when I was really young. I had. I mean, I just absolutely love navy blue. I have no idea why. I mm -hmm. felt the best one I had navy blue on. And my youngest daughter had that same affinity for blue. Blue was everything to her. And I'm like, well, where does that, I mean, she's, I was only, you know, five or six, she's three or four. Where, you know, where does that come from? Those, those, um, I, it just fascinates me that, <clears throat> that we have that, that, us, that we can come up to something we've never seen before. And there's this instantaneous connection. Well, well I think your question is backwards. Okay. You're assuming that the flesh that wraps around your body is you. And if you flip it, <clears throat> you know, so how do I explain this? Um, you're saying, well, how, how did I, how did I, you know, discover this, this um, experience with Navy blue? Right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's new for your consciousness, but the one that is actually attracted to it, has been attracted to it potentially maybe for generations. Okay. That makes you know sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so you're becoming aware of this other being's existence. Hmm. And, and, and we often, our ego gets in the way and says, no, well, this is the first time I'm experiencing this. And it pats you on the head and says, just sit down and let me show you who you really are. Hmm. You know, and when we realize that our bodies are just hosts correct mm -hmm. to all kinds of bacteria and weird living things and all kinds of beings live in us it's a very strange uh, uh thing but um you know f for example in my lineage 300 years ago there's a guy named don felipe de castro who comes from the same <clears throat> uh area of spain that my castros come from mm -hmm. and he went and he studied in Italy. He was um, a very powerful, famous sculptor. And um, I would say he's in my lineage just because of all the things. I don't know 100% sure, but I'm about 96% sure he is. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> and so the king of, of Spain at the time wanted to restore the, the glory of the art academy in, in the Royal Academy of Art in, in Spain. And so he asked Don Felipe um, to become the director of the academy. And so, um, so he did, and what he focused on were two 
two things. One was anatomy and two, uh, and the second was geometry, okay. <clears throat> which is basically composition, design. And he said, these are the th two things that artists have to focus on if we're going to restore this. And 300 years later, here I'm running around, you know, somebody, <laughs> like, I use my middle name, Victor, and right. people start calling me Don Victor. I'm like, what the, you know, <laughs> Don Victor, you Who's know, that? Vargas de Castro, right? And so then I find this artist, and my whole message is about composition, it's about geometry. And so That's really interesting. Where, well, not the whole message, the second part of it is telling your story, like understanding how to connect to your story, your source, your why, and then having the skills to visually communicate that. And that's geometry, composition. Right. And, and I'm like, where did this come from? You know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I used to think, oh, well, it was this teacher I had and this experience I had. And then I just realized, no, 300 years from now, there will be another one who answers the call. And if I'm lucky, it'll be somebody who carries on my DNA, not just my spirit, right? Correct, correct. And That's so, a fascinating way to look at it, it really is. Yeah, and, 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 and you, when, you, when you take, when you look at life outside of your time, your epoch, mm -hmm. and you begin to realize, oh wait, you're just a connector of the generation before and the generation that comes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then even go back further than that, you, you it becomes very humbling and your responsibility becomes so great. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Absolutely. That makes sense. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. I once asked wow. my aunt, do we have any cool people in our family? You know, <laughs> like, what, what's unique about our family? What's cool about it? And she, and her response was, we're still alive. <laughs> I'm like, what does that mean? That's like the stupidest thing I ever heard. And so I went and thought about it. I'm like, oh my God, there were times where there were kingdoms with kings and royal blood and the peasant that was eating dog crap in the street, he's still alive. That king, all the kings died, right? Mm -hmm. And right. so who, you know, <clears throat> who knows where our ancestors came from, but the fact that, you know, either the universe burped and everything was created or there's divine order to think whatever it is in the beginning the fact that we are existing means that we come from the beginning you know and mm -hmm. it's it's just beautiful to be able to to carry that mantle for 80 years and pass it on and train the next generation to honor that and train them to honor it to the point that they would train the next generation to honor it you know wow that's an awesome thought. You think more than I do. I didn't think anybody thought more than I <laughs> about this. I ruminate about everything. I mean, you know, that's lovely here listening to you. You have some very interesting perspectives. That's really neat. Well, you know, it, it changes the way we, we approach art, you know, because something I find with, with, with art is that <clears throat> if you're conscious of it or not conscious of it, this will happen and that is your art has a voice mm -hmm. absolutely and a voice is a sound a sound is a vibration it is a frequency that 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 one experiences and so the question is is what is the voice saying out of your work mm -hmm. and and two understanding that once it once you capture that alignment of lines, shapes, and values and colors, mm -hmm. it's locked there. And so 10,000 years from now, it will still vibrate exactly the same way. Hmm. So That's an, yeah. what is it, you know? So if there's a, a, set, a set of patterns in your work that vibrates in a way that causes hostility in the, in the, in the human, when we look at it, Mm -hmm. how much how much like <clears throat> how many paintings are created that's actually poisoning us because when we stand in front of it our body not reacts in a flight or fight way to it, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. it and when we fight or flight it we, we poison ourselves and then how many of those paintings are, are flooded in hospitals you know, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. so it's like <clears throat> learning how to hear the voice communicate what's being spoken having that dialogue with your painting um either before you start or while you're starting 
is, is, is crucial. And to me, that's actually where the art is. It's, it's, mm -hmm. But you, you talk a lot about the voice. What, what are your thoughts and like, what's your experience with this? Um, I think that we, I just think that we all have a voice. We all, and I don't even know what other word I would use because I think it's really hard to define. It's kind of a lot of these things you've been talking about we've been talking about over the past 10 minutes or so. And I just think that, you know, words just, they're so limiting. And I think obviously 99.9% .9 of all communication is nonverbal anyway. And mm -hmm. I think that, I think that art is a medium by which this voice, uh, all these things we've been talking about is expressed. And I think that it, kind of what I was alluding to before is that, Sometimes you don't even know what it is that you're expressing, but it's this voice, it's this vibration, whatever it is, it's coming out and it's coming out in your work and you're able to do it in a medium that expresses that, that if you tried to sit down and write an essay about it, you'd never put one word on the paper. And I think everyone has mm -hmm. that, that voice. And mm -hmm. I think art is a, an extraordinarily powerful way to express that. And I, like I said, I used to think, well, you need to know what it is you're saying. And I don't know that. I believe that anymore. I think it's nice to know what you're saying. I don't know that it's necessary. Um, and I think that, you know, there's always like, well, is it bad art? Is it good art? La, 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 la. Mm -hmm. And I guess my feeling is there's, if, if, it's, if it's truly one's voice in a piece of art, I don't think there is any bad art. I think some art is better executed than other art. Some people yeah. are more successful in sharing their voice or their message or whatever it is. But it's hard to say that, if art's an expression of your very essence, that it can be called bad. Well, I, I, I would personally disagree. Do you know what I'm saying? Oh, would, I would you? Disagree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because if there is an ideal, and the ideal in the classic sense is what we call good. It, it's mm -hmm. good, it's happy. That's the ideal. And you're responsible to make sure, like a tuning fork, that what you produce is tuned as close to that ideal as possible. But if you're in a totally different direction, you know, if the voice inside of you saying is going, it says, go up, go up. And you're, and you're creating something that's horizontal. You're just in a wrong. Now, the horizontal nature of that thing on itself is neither good or bad. But if, mm -hmm. you're, if, but if you're setting out to, and you're hearing this voice and you're going this direction and you're supposed to do verticals and you do a horizontal, the horizontal in that case is bad. It 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 it, it pulls from the oh, so far from the ideal from what the what the spirit is telling you to do, mm -hmm. that you're just, you know, it it, it, it just, you know. But that's another whole discussion because you can you can go into you know the idea of good and bad, and that's it, it, maybe there is an ideal. I don't know, but I, what, I would one, personally you know, stay away from that. Yeah, I, you know, I think that that's a whole that's a whole nother that's Absolutely. a whole nother discussion, and uh, and it's hard to define things too. I think in terms of good and bad, I think that I guess I'm a social worker, so I'm I'm coming from a whole different perspective where one mm -hmm. of part of my training is not to label anything, is yeah. to take it at at face value for what it is, and then and then take a look at it and. Um, uh, and I, I guess I, I come from, you know, I come from that perspective. Um, yeah. uh, it, I think, I think ultimately, you know, people are responsible for whatever they do, for whatever product they, mm -hmm. they put out. But I think in the process, um, I don't know if prejudging is helpful. Does that make any sense? I, I agree. I think it's really important that like, if you look at the Bible, um, you know, the original sin is, is living or sustaining yourself off of what is good and what is bad, mm -hmm. right? It's having this knowledge base to say, this is good and this is bad, you know? And in that mythology, you were permitted to eat or sustain yourself on anything and everything else except for declaring over things, this is good and this is bad. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do it, death happens, separation happens, you know, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. So I agree 100%. Really, the, the words aren't about good or bad. Um, but if you want to be an effective artist, a powerful artist, a healthy mm -hmm. artist, now we can get in the conversations and the questions then are, is what you're doing powerful, healthy, and, and, and effective? Right. 
Right, like, right. And mm -hmm. change. So when, it's funny, for many, many years, I could see what was wrong in people's art and mm -hmm. I could easily tell them, you know, tweak this, you know, do this. But the problem was I was using the word art, right? And okay. so I'd be like, oh, well, yeah, your art, it sucks, right? It's not working right, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and, and people get so offended, right? And I'm like, why are people so offended? It's a... And then when I stumbled on this little trick, and that is don't use the word art because art to somebody, to most people, it means it's an expression of their soul. So when you say right, their it's soul their is voice. messed up, yeah, yes, right. you're, you're, yeah, you're talking about their soul. So then I right. was like, oh, well, your composition sucks. And they would- And that's what I was getting, like, yeah. That's what I was getting at before. There isn't bad art, but there's effective art. And there's exactly. art, that, there's d art that's done well so someone can have the same, I don't want to say the same voice because we're all unique, but the same perspective, the same en sort of energy, and one can express it in a way that is understandable, and the other person has that same impetus but just can't quite get it out there where someone can tap into what it is that they're saying. So exactly. I, think there's a, I think there's effective art and ineffective art. And yep. I, I think that's the, the, the level in which art is judged. Um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, and that's, you know, like you said, you need a skill set. And um, it's part of it. You know, and, it's, it's part of it. And that's where communication comes in really important. So, like, you can have people who, who know all these really long, fancy words and mm -hmm. suck at com communication, right? Oh, Absolutely. Because they can't, they can't convey anything and actually have people feel it, you know? Right. right. So, My husband's an educator, and it's not just a knowledge base. You have to be yes. able to communicate that. So there's, you know, there's a lot of people that have a great knowledge base but just cannot effectively communicate that. And then there's other people that can just communicate so well, they're very fun and pleasant to listen to, but their, their knowledge base is not there. Mm -hmm. And for someone to have both is really a, um, it's a blessing. It is a blessing. It is a blessing. I kind of learned that. I mean, I know he's my husband. He, he was an excellent, excellent teacher because he had both. He was able to communicate and knew what he was talking about. And it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. It's a lot of work. And I know the first time you and I met, um, we were at an art history thing, and, uh, mm -hmm. and you were saying how you're a little nervous because you feel like you're starting later in life. Mm -hmm. Very much so. <laughs> And uh, what did I say to you? Oh, quiz time. Yes. Oh, boy. I don't know that I remember. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I, I'll remember. I remember. As I say to everybody who, brings that, who, who makes that statement. And that is, there's two parts to communication. There's the message and then how you communicate it, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact that you spent these years not working on the craft of communication, but you actually mm -hmm. have something of experience right you have this these messages you can bring to people mm -hmm, that's true and so now you know you take three to five years to work and develop your craft and now you merge the two and in five years you'll be you know crushing it and um uh and so for artists who are starting later in life my message to them is to not sweat it because a lot of people who spend years and years and years developing these incredible skill sets and painting realism and this and that, mm -hmm. and they ain't got nothing to say. That's a very interesting way to look at it. You know? That's a very interesting way to look. And I do kind of feel that maybe that's what I am doing. I'm trying to um, work on my skill set to express what it is that's there. Yeah. So that, that, um, that does resonate with me for sure. And it's a beautiful thing because it's a, it's just a, there's a, a maturity in that because then you're not running around trying to be like the Joneses, right? Oh, I got to paint like this or that. It's called fatigue. You know, been there, done that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> when you get to be my age, it's like, okay, been there, done that. We're moving on. <laughs> That's why I always tell people if you're going to, if you only have a little bit of time and you got to invest something. You, there's drawing skills you can develop, painting skills you can develop, storytelling skills, right? And then mm -hmm. I would say there's composition. So if you can pick two, I would always encourage people to go towards storytelling, learn how to mm -hmm. hear and communicate, and mm -hmm. then composition because that you can be the best drawer or painter, but if you can't compose your work, right. it's highly skilled, but it doesn't work. You know? Right. 
it's not effective as, or as effective as it could be for sure. Exactly. Um, there was something uh, you're saying. Um, oh, you know, you were saying something about the voice and, and this frequency. And this is, I'm always blown away by this, this truth. And that is that when the, when humans, it might be the same with other animals, but I know when the human is, is being developed, before our brain is actually developed, our heartbeat is developed, right? Our heart. Mm -hmm, correct. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I remember years ago watching this documentary on dolphins and, and, and they said that dolphins like humans actually name their, name their children. They name their young. Hmm. And so <clears throat> you'll hear da -da 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 -da, right some weird <laughs> dolphin sound, right? Yeah, and like, very good. <clears throat> thank you, thank you. you know, but that's different than <laughs> right. Like right. another dolphin comes, right? And and so you know when we think of a name, we think of the words, but a word is only a sound. We're actually just speaking sound over each other right mm -hmm, correct we identify with sound and so when i was when i thought about it through the through the sounds of these dolphins you know it was much easier to see what was happening that they were sending out these sounds that other living beings conscious beings were identifying with mm -hmm. and so when you come back to this place and your heartbeat is the first thing and it's boom, 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 boom. what is the beat what is the sound that is your name, you know? Oh, mm -hmm. And so when you're making your art, you want to try to figure out like how to get back into that rhythm, that cadence, that frequency, that beat, that sound. Notice all these words are really communicating the same thing, that there's this pulse. The pulse, are, right. A living right? pulse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you start producing out of that, then, then you're, you know, what's funny is we call it a body of work, right? Mm -hmm. Just like when we're born, you start with that little boom, 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 and all of a sudden this body forms around it, right? And it's, it's fascinating what we get to do. It is. <laughs> it really is. Your perspective is fascinating. I just love listening to you talk. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like interviewing you. <laughs> well, um, what, what, uh, where do you see yourself going in the next few years with your beautiful fabric? Mm -hmm. I'm going to call them fabric paintings, but that's not the right word to call them. But Yeah. Um, well, I would like to continue um, what I had talked about in the beginning of the podcast. And I would like to like get a body of work together mm -hmm. that um, um, I got uh, Clifford Still. He has a museum in um, Buffalo. And um, he's, you know, an abstract artist and he wanted, he didn't want just one of his pieces shown. He wanted like a place where just his stuff was shown. And these, these pieces are just huge. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of strange and maybe egotistical and I don't get it. I don't understand. So I started reading about it and he talked about that, that, when he works on a piece of art, it's it kind of kind of we're talking about this pulse kind of thing. It's not us. It's not a separate piece. It's in context. Mm -hmm. And he wanted all his art pieces together in context. Mm. And I thought I started. I keep thinking about that. I keep thinking about that. And like even the present thing that I'm working on, I would love to get a body of work together. Here we go with the body of work together again. Um, that in a sense speaks to each other mm -hmm. and is presented as a whole. So given the time that it takes to produce a piece, um, it's very time consuming to do what I do. That's going to be, I think my goal for the next year or two is to try and put together a, a body of work that, that speak to each other. That's kind of a, a unit, if you will. Um, and uh, I've also done faces in the past and I might sprinkle a few faces in that in the, uh, in the mix there. Mm to give myself a break, but that's, mm -hmm. I think, going to be my focus at that's this beautiful. time. So. As, a, as a social worker, did you have to, or were you a social worker? Or was that, yes. Okay. Um, I was very familiar to that world growing up in foster care my whole life. So, mm -hmm. so you'll know this, that 
one thing they tried to do is to keep the siblings together as much as possible. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what you're talking about is that. <clears throat> and, mm -hmm. um, right. And one thing that I do when I'm coaching um, artists and we're, say we're building out for a show or something, it might be five or 15 paintings that we're doing at a time. But what I have them do is I have them conceive the idea and design them mm -hmm. before they ever mix paint. And so okay. they're, they're building all of these paintings exactly at the same time so that when they're done, they're all the same. You know, they're at the same right. level. You don't have one that looks like, oh, yeah, that was done five years ago, right? And they're just hanging mm -hmm. out with each other. You actually have this, this, this body, this family of work. Mm -hmm. And the results of it um, is very fascinating because <clears throat> on three occasions that I can think of, um, someone either went into negotiations or actually bought all the paintings. Oh, because wow. Because they did not want to break To break family. it up. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And so if you do them individually, then people will buy it. You know, it just... If you do them as one, it becomes harder, <clears throat> you know, to break it because they weren't designed to be individually separated into Correct. homes. Right. 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 So it's uh so I encourage you as you go through that route that maybe you spend some time thinking about, you know, in a way it's kind of like saying, well, you know, I want five kids, so I probably shouldn't get that two bedroom. I probably should <laughs> focus on maybe getting that six bedroom house. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right. You know, and just knowing where you're going may help you make clearer decisions that actually facilitate being close to that vibration, you know? Mm -hmm. Correct. Absolutely. So when, when you're going through this process, what are, um, some resources that you use? Um, well, I use uh, local quilts, quilt stores, quilt shops, fabric, fabric stores, also online fabric stores to, mm -hmm. um, to get my stuff. Uh, I, I wouldn't survive without Michael's because I get all my canvases there and they have the 50% off. So it's actually affordable for me to do that. I can just, and one thing I do try and do um, is, when I do design a piece, I have a, a size in mind, um, which sometimes works and sometimes doesn't because I hate to, I'm kind of in a quandary. I hate to like design the piece to be a, a specific size, mm -hmm. but I almost have to because I can't afford to custom frame and custom canvas and that. So I kind of design it. I kind of make it sometimes bigger than it needs to be because then I get the canvas a certain size, which then I can stretch and tweak and that. So I, Michael's has been in, invaluable because I, I can afford the canvases there. Um, mm. They're very reasonable once I get my 50% coupon and go in and get it. Um, I, uh, I think the biggest resource is probably my husband because he is fully supportive of me doing this. And for many years, I was a stay-at-home mom. And so when my kids left, I thought, well, now it's time for me to get a real J-O-B and earn some money here. And he knew, he knew I wanted to do art. He goes, no, just stay home and do what you love to do. And so he is um, beyond supportive, mm -hmm. especially financially with my, me doing what I do. He's my biggest, my biggest resource in, in many, many ways. Um, he empowers me to do, you know, what I do. Um, and then I try and respect that by, you know, I try not to overspend. I try and I, I you know, I get what I need to get. And it's interesting because um, I had worked with a, a teacher once and she had said, like, you go down your basement and you make a piece and she says, and you just use what's there. She, you don't run down and say, I need this. You just use what's mm. there and you become more creative. And that's really what I try and do. I try, I mean, I do go and I have a stash and I get fabric, but once I start, I try and, um, I don't want to say economize, but I try and use what it is that I have. Mm. And I find that makes me a much more creative person. Um, and I also, I'm a firm believer in happy accidents. And, you know, I might be working on a piece and then, you know, I, you know, like I said, my pieces are organic and they just kind of, they, they generate, they're not as, they're sort of pre-planned. I mean, I have a general idea, but they change and they change and they change. And sometimes they'll change and I'll look at it and go, oh, why did I do that? And then other times I look at it and go, 
well, I would have, that's really cool. I really like that. And then I, I kind of jump off from there into the next piece. And I'm always looking for happy accidents in my work because um, I just find that trying to use what I have and, and being, I don't want to say economical, but thoughtful with what I purchase and with what I do, and then allowing the work to evolve and looking for things that I didn't, that are kind of unexpected. Sometimes mm -hmm. that's when I do my best work. Indeed. It's when I do my best work. So, um, <clears throat> So there are a lot of resources that I, that I do use, and they really depend on if they speak to my aesthetic. And actually, and, and I hate to say it, but price is a factor because I don't have unlimited, unlimited funds to just, you know, get whatever it is that, that I want. And, uh, but like I said, I think that's actually to my benefit. It, well, it is. You know, <clears throat> people think, oh, creativity. But it, creativity doesn't need to exist if there's no constraints. Correct. All right. So by putting constraint on yourself or just being aware that you are in constraint, you have to, it, that's the breeding ground for creativity. And so it is. <laughs> I think it is. I think some people are bothered by it, but I think it's, it's very helpful for me. Hey, you know, I mean, <laughs> you limit your palette <laughs> color, you know, to basically three colors like you do. Um, <laughs> Yeah. And, so. and if you're in my, I'm in my studio. If I turn around, I've got a whole wall of colored fabric, and I, <clears throat> I will buy more, and then I will proceed to pick up the browns and the grays. And the, yeah. It was yeah. interesting. I used to work at this um, school, uh, which was a school built for creatives, uh, creative kids, singers, dancers, artists, mm -hmm. musicians, and they were very highly creative kids. They were wonderful, um, well behaved. Most of them came from an affluent background. Um, mm -hmm. And then I went to work in an urban inner city school. Mm -hmm. And it became very clear to me not too long in that the inner city school, their creativity was far more powerful mm, interesting. than the comfortable kids. Mm -hmm. And because the comfortable kids that, you know, that was a way that they expressed themselves, but it was also kind of more of a hobby, more of a privilege to do that. Okay. Um, where the inner city kids, you know, if you don't know what you're going to eat tonight, you got to get creative. Right? Yes. Yes, it's, exactly. Creativity becomes exactly. a necessity just to live, to survive. Mm -hmm. And, yes. um, and, and to adapt, which is really the, the core to intelligence. So uh, mm -hmm. I found these inner city kids to be highly intelligent, highly creative. And, um, and it was, it was a joy to, to, to see that in them, but it came out of Absolutely. necessity. Right? <laughs> it does. And I, I, I think it, that's a positive, the constraints. I mean, obviously not specifically the inner city things, but in general, in life, when you, this is what you have, make, you know, here's your yeah. lemons, make lemonade. I think that wonderful things can happen. I really do. I agree with you 100%. There's a lot of, you know, big business millionaire people in the United States, they started in humble beginnings. And mm -hmm. one of the tragedies to big, like when you develop a big business is that, or a successful business is that the next generation that grows up in the wealth, they mm -hmm. don't know the struggle. And yes. therefore they don't know the creativity that's required, you know, as well as the work ethic and the labor that goes into it. And exactly. So, so a lot of times they squander it because they just, they just don't know. Mm -hmm. They don't have that in them, right? And, that's right. And so it's, it's an interesting thing. So two more questions for you. Um, sure. If there was a, a little person I'm thinking of specifically of a 12 year old that I know. Okay. Um, who loves sewing and fabric, <clears throat> my daughter. Um, okay. And you were going to, you got to have tea with this person. What kind of advice would you give that person if they were really, really looking for, looking to love fabric and communicate themselves through it? Well, first of all, I doubt that we'd be doing tea because if you really love fabric and you're kinesthetic, you're going to just jump right in. So I'd probably meet with them with a whole batch of fabric or something, and we would just play and talk because I think I think the uh, for me, especially if you're going to be a fiber artist, it sounds dumb, but a lot of it's playing. A lot of it is just mm. diving in and what if, what if this, what if I did this, what if I did that. 
Um, and I always think starting with where you're at. And if it's a 12 year old child, you know, what do you like to do? What's important to you? What do you think about? And then translate that into, you know, a form of art. I have a friend that kind of wanted to try it and she's going, well, I can't do it. I can't do art. And I said, well, I mean, it's as simple as take, she just went on a cruise, take your best, your favorite picture from the cruise, the water, whatever it is. And we can put that in a sleeve and we can outline those shapes that you like. And then Mm -hmm. you can go look at your fabric and we can try and match the picture or, you you know, you can put in how you feel about it. Let's put some fabric in there that makes you feel like you felt when you took the picture. So I think it's a matter of diving in and playing and experimenting and the what ifs. There aren't any right answers until you get to the point where you've created it and then you can step back and look and say, okay, what, what do I want to change or what's not working? But I think prior to that, it's, it's just diving in and doing it. I, I really think that, I mean, yes, you got to talk about it, but the idea of having tea talking about fiber art just doesn't, <laughs> doesn't work for me. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I, I Do they have to change it to margaritas? Fabric. Is that what it is? No, or, or a martini? Or a, couple, yeah, a stash of fabric, and you'd have to, you'd have to talk and do. You know what I'm saying? So Indeed. I think, it's, I think it's just understanding. And if you don't understand what your perspective is, okay, what's your favorite color? We'll start there. Start with something that's important to you. I taught a friend a quilt, and um, and she had so many questions and she'd never sewn a seam and she was very worried. And I said, well, let's go pick up fabric. And what do you like? What do you like? And so we went with what she liked and that's, and that's, and mm. you will be motivated if you're doing yeah, something, yeah. she's working in a color she likes or in a style. That's where I think the motivation, you know, comes from. And so I think you need to start with what do you like? If you like navy blue, like I did, let's go get some navy blue fabric and see what we can do with it. And um, you start there. I think the skills come as you do it, especially with fiber art. You're not going to sit down and make a flawless piece. It's just not going to happen. So start with the, I don't want to say the emotional side. I think start with the intuitive side. Start with what makes you click, what makes you happy. And then we're going to use fabric to express that. That's great. That's awesome. Beautiful. Um, Here's a, since you, you're saying that some people pick up the color. Mm-hmm. You don't use color for the most part. Um, but if you did, what would your thought on using color in your work be like? Well, I just like at the one I had said where I did kind of a collection and that was all in color and I did it, um, to stretch myself because I, I don't usually work in color and I wanted to, I mean, I love color. I love the work that um, that comes from the color. It's just that if push comes to shove, I'm always going to go back to mm-hmm. um, the neutrals. Um, there, I um, got this one um, book by Raina Gilman, and she's a quilter. And I love all colors, and I love putting colors and patterns together. I do things that you're not supposed to do, like you, you know, you're not supposed to put patterns together. Quilters are very rigid, by the way, have a lot of rules, and you're not mm-hmm. to do this, and you're not to that, which I thought, oh, I can't do this. So I'm putting stuff together that you're not supposed to put together. And there was this one book my friend got me by Raina Gilman, and her theory was there is no ugly color, and all colors go together. It's just how you put them together, you know? And I thought, well, that's exactly how I feel because I don't think like I like this color, I like this color, I don't like this color. They all work. It's just a matter of how you use those colors and I think what your piece is trying to say. And I think part of, I think part of the reason I go in neutrals is my pieces, I think, are about mood a lot of times. Mm. And so I think I choose color by the mood of the piece, mm-hmm. you know, that I want. I think that that's, that's big for me. Um, and so I know, um, for, I suppose it's true in painting too. I know you white, there's like gray, white, and there's yellow, white, and there's all mm-hmm. kinds of whites and you do not mix whites. Whites, you have to make sure your whites match. And I thought, well, why? So I got out a bunch of different whites, none of which went, I mean, there's gray, there's yellow, there's pink <laughs> whites. There's, and I put them all in the same piece and it's beautiful. I think mm, it's beautiful, I, but it's, it's yeah. the way you put it together, yep. you know, the, the repeating what's there. So for me, color is very free in the sense that I don't think there's ugly colors. I think you can put a lot of colors together that people say, oh, my God, you can't do that. But you can. And it's fun. It's fun to experiment with color. And I think that's why I keep buying color fabric. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. 
Can you dye your own color? That is, uh, a lot of people do that, and a lot of people get exactly the color they want then, but it is very time-consuming. Mm. Um, it's You have to have like a whole other area to do it because you can't <clears throat> get it near anything else because you have the buckets with the dye, which yeah. very co- can be very caustic. And I just thought I spend a lot of time doing what I do and to add the dyeing process to it just – it, it just really doesn't, you know, sound fun. And what what was really interesting, and we talked about how constraints can make you more creative. Well, I went to a, a class, a, a quilting class, and I was with people who dyed their own fabric and had access to a lot of resources. And I came with my little Joanne fabric, but what I had done is I had stamped on it. Like I mm-hmm. put some paint and, oh, that's a really neat fabric. Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that? And I go, <laughs> Joanne's. And they go, you didn't get that from Joanne's. I said, well, yeah, I did, and I just stamped it. And I thought to myself, I came up with something that these women who dyed their own fabric and been doing this for years and put out beautiful work found interesting. And again, I thought it's because I couldn't afford to go buy the hand dye fabric, yeah. so I chose not to dye my own. And yes, that would be nice. I think it would be fun to learn, but it's very time consuming. And again, my fabric is, is commercially bought fabric, which has really gone up a notch. I mean, there's beautiful mm. fabric out there. But in the past, it's been a challenge to buy commercially bought fabric and make it look art, like artistic, make it mm-hmm. look different and interesting. And that was part of my process. And I learned a lot because I had to, because I didn't want my fabric to necessarily look like standard fabric. I wanted it to look different. And so I learned how to make it look different because I had to. Mm-hmm. And um, so, yes, you can dye, and it's, uh, I have a friend who dyes, and it's beautiful fabric, absolutely beautiful fabric, but it's, it is very time-consuming, and you need an area in your home to set aside to do that. Um, and it might actually be a good opportunity to drink some tea while you're doing that. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> w- would you ever consider using colored thread? I use colored thread a lot, actually. Oh, you do? Okay. I do, yeah. And, and yeah, I that- do. And and that keeps it very subtle then, right? Yes, it uh, can. And sometimes sometimes I don't. Sometimes I will put a brighter color in there. The, when I'm working on now, I've kind of established kind of the palette I have. That's not to say in a few pieces I wouldn't throw something in there that of color. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't have. I'm not done, that far down the road yet. But um, I think because I like Franz Klein so much, I just love the black and white. That yeah. I was. That's what I did for you know a year or so. And I'm now just putting what I call dead purple. <laughs> I work and some grays and stuff. I mean, that's really, you know, that's really pushing the envelope there. And then I put some variegated thread in there. And I like what I'm doing, so I'll probably stick with that. But I do have used color, and I have every color thread you can imagine. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I do do that. Yeah, I love the idea of the grays because, like, if you look at, like, Monet's work or something, a lot of times we look at it and we say, oh, it's so colorful, right? But mm-hmm. When you actually look at the the brush strokes of color, they're almost all grays. Gray, and they're mm-hmm. just these slight, you know, hue shifts. And then the usually you have what they call a dragon's eye or a soloist, where it's this moment of high saturated color. Mm-hmm. The color is strategic in the fact that it it activates all the grays, right? Correct. Yes. And yes. Then you have this beautiful symphony that goes on in your eyeballs. Um, <clears throat> So, and I, I, I'm kind of excited to see um, as you weave in color into those gray areas, how mm-hmm. that how that changes changes it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But um, but your work is magnificent. Thank you. <laughs> I enjoy what I do. I really do. So here's my last question for you. Most sure. important question, and that is, mm. what do you like to eat? <laughs> or or make well, you, or make well you know I I I honestly and I'm not exaggerating I like to eat almost anything I I really do enjoy food there's not a lot of a lot of food that I don't like I love lobster it's probably my all time favorite <laughs> is it because it's Absolutely. kinetic you get to jump in there and get messy with it I have no I thought I I, I love water I thought I think I've been a mermaid or something in prior life I don't know what, <laughs> mermaid what, something. <laughs> But um, no, I love lobster. I love coffee. I mean, coffee, I don't consider that a food, but that's my mainstay every single day. The only thing I won't eat are beets because I had them when I was young and they made me, they made me really <laughs> sick. And so that's, I mean, I do like food. There's not, 
It's kind of like fabric. All fabric is beautiful, and so is all food. So <laughs> it's hard to make a choice. There we are. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, okay. I can now. All right. Um, I have this little thing on my headset, and I accidentally hit it, and I'm like, what? Oh, that's fine. <laughs> um, so you said lobster and coffee. Hmm. Mm-hmm. That just sounds mm-hmm. like something you never want to have together unless you're yeah, I would agree. I would a captain agree. with a big cigarette. <laughs> like yeah. for some reason. <laughs> Give me some of that coffee, lobster, and cigarettes. Coffee would be the morning. But my goal, which I did do, I don't have much of a bucket list at all because I don't know. It doesn't interest me that much. But the one thing I guess you would say is a bucket list was to go to state of Maine and get the biggest lobster I could and eat it. And that's exactly what I did. I had, I think, a two-pound lobster. And what? I ate the whole thing. Yes. I, I wanted awesome. to eat. I wanted to eat till I was sick. Don't ask me why, but I just was going to go get a live lobster. The only thing is, you know, they were. You have to you know, take it apart, which I'm not real good at. But he was so nice. The waiter just looked at me. and goes, "I'll do it for you." So he dismantled the whole thing, and I had two pounds of lobster and a bucket of butter, and that was great. Wow, that sounds so good. <laughs> it was great. It was absolutely great. If you have a chance to go to Maine and have a lobster, do it. You won't be disappointed. Oh wow. Wow, that's beautiful. <laughs> well, where can uh, do you set your website up? It's no, it's still in progress. My daughter's helping me uh, launch it, so I'd say within the month we'll have okay. it up. Okay, so where would it be? Like, what's the URL for it? Oh, you're going to ask me that. I'm not quite sure. I think I think there's I think it's l y n n dot f i z e l. Um dot com okay but she set it up she's she set it up and then we've been working on it. and honestly i haven't even i didn't even pay attention to what the url was it's okay. very similar it's something so like that there might not it, be a dot yes i will when you get it get it to me and i'll put it in the notes so that people can okay. click on it and, and go visit you there That's um great. lynn this was a beautiful conversation it uh, was it was very nice thank you in just 30 days the core 80 experience teaches you to decode the intentional design underneath great masterpieces. Through video lessons, assignments, and feedback, you learn to recognize the underlining structures like thrust maps, echoes, and gamuts that give master compositions substance and gravitas. Knowing how master artists and illustrators compose their artwork unlocks your ability to give your artwork more meaning and energy. Enroll today and get a seven-day, no-hassle, money-back guarantee at core80.com.